Okay, so for today, we are actually going to start with a new chapter. Um, you guys have already watched the family styles, uh, parenting styles video, which is great because that's going to help you with the part of this lecture where we start talking about family um, and parenting styles. Um, there's a lot to unpack in this chapter, okay? So this chapter is very broad. We talk about families that can be like literally any combination, right? And it includes so many different factors that it's really difficult to cover every single piece. So what I'm going to try to do here is cover the main focus of the big sort of factors that go into adolescent development and the family dynamic. So it's a big, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge overarching area, but know that it covers a lot of different domains. So some things that we're going to cover in this chapter um, are the family processes. We're going to talk about something called reciprocal socialization. We're going to talk about families as a system, as a whole. Um, uh, I talk about this a lot of times in neuroscience and when we talk about different neurotransmitters and how they interact and how they change families kind of act as like a system like that. Um, it's, it's something where you, you, you affect one little thing, right. And it's going to ripple effect into all the other, the pieces, none of your family parts happen in a vacuum. Um, think of it as like a universe or a solar system. You know, if you affect one little thing, it's going to impact everything else. And so when you talk about family, factors, you have to look about the whole, you have to look at it as a whole, but you also have to look at the pieces and then how they fit together. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit um, in this. We're also going to talk about maturation and not just adolescent maturation. We're also going to talk about parents and, you know, um, how they mature and how that changes relationships as well. We're going to get into um, really deeply into the relationships between adolescents, their parents, emerging adults and their parents. So we're going to talk about parents as managers. We're going to talk a little bit, very basic parenting styles. We're going to talk about how uh, moms and dads parent differently and then how they parent together. We're going to talk about autonomy and attachment. Um, and that's probably what we're going to get to today. So we're probably going to get to autonomy and attachment and then next class, which will be a video. So I'm going to post a video with a separate set of a, a continuation of notes for uh, Friday. So instead of class, I'm going to post a video just like we're doing right now, except it's just going to be me talking about those things. And if you have any questions, you know, after that, please email me. And what that video is going to cover is going to extend this a little bit, talking about emerging adult uh, relationships with their parents, intergenerational relationships. We're going to talk about siblings, things like birth order and how, um, you know, that may or may not factor in. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the differences that we see in a changing society. Um, you know, our society is changing. It is different. It's, you know, um, it's, you know, it's, it's ever evolving. And that's something that we have to um, consider in this kind of research because um, divorce is much more common. Um, there's much more common to have blended families or to have families that are merging, right? So if you have a divorced couple and a divorced couple, and then they're remarrying and then, you know, other kids are, are coming into the mix from other families. And then you have kids that are, um, you know, half siblings, things like that. All of that's going to change the dynamic. Um, and because, uh, divorce rates are, you know, uh, pretty high considering, um, you know, what they used to be, we can see that that's, that's becoming a lot more common these days. Um, also looking at things like working parents, kids who are adopted, gay and lesbian parents, um, and what is the family dynamic there? Um, we're also going to look a little bit at uh, culture and ethnicity as well. And what that changes in the family dynamic. Um, what the culture and ethnicity studies can tell us is what sort of factors and what behaviors and what relationship um, dynamics and domains are universal across all culture and which one changes based off of what culture ethnicity that you're looking at. So if there is a change, if like, you know, Japanese families look different from American families in a, uh, let's say conflict, right, then we can say, well, maybe conflict is not something that's universal. And that's not something that we see um, in every single scenario and in, in, in families across all human nature. Um, so it can give us a really good insight on what what things are or ev what everybody goes through and what something that um, maybe one culture might do better than another culture um, or worse, right? 
And then finally, we're going to end with a little bit of social policy, adolescents and families, but we're not really going to take a big deep dive in that. Um, that's just going to be just kind of touching the surface there. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and get into the first um, uh, series here. So <laughs> what we're going to talk about here is this really interesting relationship between adolescents and parents. And so the family system, as we've kind of talked about, is, is a really complex thing. Um, it all starts with reciprocal socialization. So this is where um, children and adolescents socialize parents just as much as parents socialize them. It's a reciprocal relationship. They are actually, uh, as kids influence their parents, the parents are influencing the kids and it goes back and forth. It's not like a one-sided situation. Um, we often uh, joke about how when you, as a parent, you have little kids, like, you know, two and three-year-old kids, and they will always constantly embarrass you. This is how I kind of like to think about reciprocal socialization, although it's much bigger than this. Um, and so little kids tend to embarrass you all the time. And it's like, you know, you you know, what you do to the kid, uh, what you do with the kid around and they'll like walk up to somebody and say something like, oh, you're ugly or why do you have this mole on your face? And you're like, oh my God, and you're, and you're mortified. Um, and you know, if people think, oh, well, you know, kids are, kids will embarrass you. But then as they age, you start to embarrass the kid, <laughs> you know, as you had get teenagers and they're like embarrassed to be around you. Um, I always feel like you kind of, that reciprocal relationship ends up coming back full circle, but really what this is, is this can be in the moment, right? This can be, how does, how do you parent your child? How do you act around your child? And then how does your child act around you? Those things are going to work together and influence each other. And so things like how you feel, um, you know, what mood you're in, what emotion you're feeling, um, how you run your ship, right? All of these things are going to influence and be influenced by your children. And so it's really important to realize that um, that is a process that by which that is natural and that occurs um, in all situations. Um, another thing to consider, and we've I've kind of touched on this before, is that families can be thought of like a constellation. They're um, a constellation of subsystems. Uh, we have generation, gender, role, all of these things fitting into this social system. Um, each person in this system is a participant in the subsystems, right? So if you have a parent, if you have a grandparent, if you have an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, um, a sibling, all of these uh, people play a particular role, but they also play a role in the sort of the, the short term, what you see here, but also in the grand scheme of things. And any person's particular family member's behavior, as it changes, it's going to influence the behavior of other family members, right? And so um, again, it doesn't occur in a vacuum. If you have a child who is really, really stubborn, for example, that's going to influence the parenting style. That's going to influence the parent's reactions. That's going to influence the sibling reactions, that's going to really um, change the dynamic of the family. So these are really important things to consider is that all of the family members have something to contribute and also contribute and are um, uh, influenced by the contributions. Um, Another thing to, to think about um, is about the link between marital relationships and parenting, right? And so the most consistent findings, um, and I'm sure you guys are not surprised by this, is that happily married parents tend to be more sensitive, more responsive, warmer, and more affectionate to both their children and then later adolescents. And so that is something that is a really consistent finding, which again, I'm sure is not surprising to you guys. You know, that's pretty, that, that makes a lot of sense. That's very intuitive. Um, we also find that the, the family climate is important, right? So um, in, it doesn't even matter if the couple is married or divorced or, you know, uh, living together, but not married. It, that doesn't really matter as much as what is the family climate? Um, do we see a positive engagement? Do we see warmth? Do we see affection? Um, do we see this as a, as a climate where um, kids feel comfortable coming to their parents with problems, where parents um, are uh, open to talking about certain issues? You know, what is the climate of the family? And, and, and we find that, and these are longitudinal studies over many years um, with the same families, find that a positive family climate is linked to a positive engagement that the adolescents will show their spouse 20 years later right? Um, so we see that 
this positive family climate is important for the relationships during early adulthood and, and how that person is going to uh, react to their romantic partner. So being able to establish a really positive, warm uh, family climate um, is going to essentially cause that person to uh, be more likely to have really good interactions and engagements um, with their spouses, with their romantic partners um, as they transition out of adult uh, out of adolescence and into early adulthood. So very, very important that you know these sorts of things are established early on because then that's going to impact how that adolescent, grows out of puberty, grows out of adolescence and into a, a very healthy um, family dynamic for themselves. And then again, you know, just kind of pushing it on into if they have kids and they have a particular family climate, that is going to hopefully be reflected on what they had as they were children. So all of these things kind of, you know, move into uh, the uh, emerging adulthood stage. So this right here is just kind of an idea of what, what I'm referring to by that reciprocal relationship, right? So we have um, parenting um, influences, of course, the child's behavior and development, which can influence marital relationships, right? Which can then influence parenting. Now, parenting can, of course, um, be related to marital relationship, which then can affect child and, and behavioral development, which again, then can affect parenting. So this is just a really, really interesting dynamic. If you have um, a very stressful marriage, if you have a, a situation and you can kind of pick any of these. So if you first, if you start with a stressful marriage, that can impact your parenting style, which can then impact your children's behavior, which can then make things more stressful, which can then put more stress on your marriage, which then can then, you know, influence your parenting style. And then it just is like this big circle, right? So how do you break the cycle? Well, you fix something, right? So if you can try to fix, for example, the stress that comes from the marital relationship, and then if you can try to also uh, fix another factor, let's say the parenting style, then both of those things can then influence the child's development and behavior. And then it can provide less stress um, for the uh, relationship, uh, the, par the marital relationship, and then make parenting slightly easier. And so if you can, um, so if you have a family dynamic that needs counseling, that needs, you know, some, some support because there's some, um, perhaps there's some stress from the marriage and then what, what you're seeing is the kids are misbehaving or they're getting in trouble at school or they're maybe even getting in illegal trouble, then what you would do is say, okay, well, what part of this dynamic do we need to tackle? Oh, okay, well, our relationship my, you know, my, my husband and I relationship isn't going very well. Well, let's see if we can fix that. And let's give you some parenting strategy tips to try to work into that and reduce that stress. And then in the, in the end, the idea is, is that you're going to improve that, that child's behavior. Um, so these are all definitely ways that you can kind of approach this dynamic to get in there and fix um, some of the stressful factors that could be exacerbating whatever's going on. Does anybody have any questions about that? Does everybody kind of see how the reciprocal relationship works and how it's kind of all, it's just very like, um, it's very intertwined, right? Okay. So give me a thumbs up if you feel pretty good about that. Thanks for that thumbs up. Good, good, good. Okay. Um, okay. So let's talk about maturation. So remember I told you we're going to talk about adolescent and we're also going to talk about parents. So when it comes to adolescent changes, um, you guys know that, you know, there's going to be these physical, cognitive, socio, socio emotional changes um, that adolescents go through. They're, they're starting a new kind of um, uh, section of their life, this new kind of part of development. There, there's a lot of different kinds of changes happening, both with their body, with their minds, with their brains. Um, they're making new and different kinds of relationships with their peers. They're spending more time with their peers, which I'll get to in just a minute. Um, and these, all of these things, all of these changes can influence parent-adolescent relationships. But remember, it's a reciprocal relationship. So whatever changes they're going to experience are going to impact the parents. And whatever changes happens in the parents going to infl influence the adolescent, right? And so we know that um, 
that and, and and this is this is this is something that you know we've we've looked at it a long time looking at this idea of conflict right so um arguing fighting with parents um you know trying to uh you know get more autonomy things like that you know these are things they they call it the storm and strife period right um, or storm and stress and we're going to talk a little bit about like where the actual research comes in. Um, we do know that there is more conflict at this time, but it's probably not quite as bad as the original um, psychologists, you know, uh, information research studies on this. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. But what we're finding is, um, is that the conflict that does arise, right, is pretty standard. It's, it's, it's pretty normal. Um, and we often find that the worst conflict um, tends to be uh, during uh, the sort of apex of pubertal growth, like right as you know, right as they're going through that kind of real um, uh, uh, so body changes and, and, and mind changes when it comes to puberty. And we actually see a lot of conflict between mothers and sons. Um, and that tends to be most stressful during that, that, you know, sort of apex of pubertal growth. Um, and we find that when an adolescent is an early maturing adolescent, um, they tend to experience more conflict with their parents than those adolescents who are maturing at a later time or a more traditionally like typical age. So early, earlier, um, uh, maturing adolescents tend to experience a little bit more conflict than those who are maturing later or on time for the, the average age. And we know that a lot of times, um, a lot of the conflict will come from things like the fact that these adolescents are uh, getting, they're getting smarter, they're getting more mature cognitively, right? And so, um, for example, we'll see that um, their logical skills, their, their skills of logic and understanding consequences, they're getting better um, and they're getting more complex. And so um, as an adolescent is developing these sort of logical skills, they know when they're being disciplined and they know, for example, in they, they know that they're you know, uh, that they might have done something wrong or they might have done something that has a consequence, but now they want to know in detail why they're being disciplined, right? And so they, they, they're they actually, you know, so much better with their logic, logic skills that now they're like, wait, what did I do that's wrong? And why are you punishing me in this way? And then why are you punishing me this hard? Like before, when you have like a four-year-old and you're like, you know what, time out for four minutes, you know, that's just it. And the kid goes to time out. They're not like, well, why four minutes? You know, some kids do, but usually they're like, oh, I don't want to go to time out. But in adolescent, if you're like, you know what, I'm going to take away your video game or your Xbox or your PlayStation. Um, and they're like, but why, what did I do? And how long are you taking it away for? And why? last time I did that, you didn't take it away. And so they want to know like in detail, like, why am I being punished? Why am I being dis disciplined? And, you know, why isn't so-and-so being disciplined? And so it, be it becomes a lot more complicated because as a parent, now you feel like you are explaining yourself and that's completely natural for a, a, an adolescent who has now started to develop these logical skills to want to know why is this happening to me? And, you know, what are your reasons? And of course that can cause conflict. Cause of course, you know, you guys probably remember when you were teens, if your parent was like, no, you can't go to so-and-so's house. And you're like, but why, what did I do? Why can't I go? You let me go yesterday. And so you start to question things, right? You also find that this uh, particular uh, stage in, in, in maturation, you're seeing more idealistic thought, right? And so this can be troublesome for the parent adolescent relationship because now your adolescent kid is now going, well, they're comparing you as a parent to what they consider an ideal parent, right? So they have all these nice examples. They have examples of other friends' parents. They have example of your parent, if they have their grandparents around. And now they're like, well, um, well, I think that, you know, X, Y, Z makes up an ideal parent and they're going to start comparing you to their idealistic version of what a parent should be. Well, you know, I don't think parents should take this away. And I don't think that belongs to you. And I bought that with my own money. And I don't think a good parent would do X, Y, Z. And so now as a parent, you're having to deal with the conflict of like, well, you're not living up to these expectations <laughs> that your adolescent has about what a good parent ideal parent is, right? Um, also, when it comes to expectations, expectations for parents and adolescents for each other, that's going to change, right? So um, pre-adolescent, 
children tends to be um, tend to be more compliant. They tend to be more uh, easier to manage. And then as these kids start to enter puberty, they start to question things. They start to ask rationales. Well, why why are you making me do this chore when you're not making my brother do the chore? You know. And so you might say, well, you know, now you have to find yourself explaining yourself because you expect. Now, now that your child is, you know, uh, more responsible, that maybe they need more chores, and then your your adolescent might be like, well, I don't think so, um, and so you know, you might you might have certain expectations for your adolescent as they're maturing, and then that adolescent is going to have expectations for you as a parent, um, and this you know this also goes to any kind of relationship. So teachers, for example, you know, you as you start to if you want you know to teach teens, if you want to teach, you know, uh, junior high, high school, this is something that you're going to deal with as well. They're going to have changing expectations for you as a teacher as they mature, just like you're going to have different expectations from a seventh grader to a ninth grader. You know, you're going to say, well, you did that in eighth grade, but I expect you to do it differently in ninth grade. Um, and, you know, so not only are they dealing with, because remember, everything's a big system to them. Uh, you know, and, and you're part of that system as a teacher. So they have different expectations from their parents. Their parents have different expectations from them and they're dealing with that, right? They have to deal with that. And then they come to school. Now they have to deal with your expectations and deal with expectations from other teachers and their expectations of you. Well, I expect that you, you know, give me more time for homework or, you know, I expect that you allow me to uh, turn things in late or, you know, whatever, because of their experience in the previous grade. And so that, remember that anytime you're dealing with it, with an adolescent, you know, they're already, they're dealing with this in a system, they're dealing with it at home, they're dealing with it in, um, you know, other, uh, uh, like um, after school, they're dealing with it in sports, they're dealing with it in all these other dynamics of their life. Um, and potentially as they get a little bit older, working a job, right? So these are all things that you should probably consider if you want to be a teacher, if that's, you know, or at least working with adolescents in any capacity. Um, now, during this particular um, uh, time period, um, and we've talked about this before, adolescents are going to be spending more time with their peers um, than they did when they were younger. Um, and they're going to be spending, in some cases, more time with their peers than their own parents. OK, and so because of, you know, this kind of change in, in who they're surrounding themselves with, they tend to push more independence during this time because they want to be out of that, you know, that, you know, spending time with mom and dad. So they're going to want to be more independent. So instead of, you know, maybe having a friend over, maybe they want to go to a neutral location, maybe they're going to the mall or a skate park or something where they don't want to be. Um, you know, in a place with the parents supervising them in another room, you know, they're going to want to be more independent, they want to be in a different location. Um, and so those are things that um, come along with autonomy. And we're, we're going to talk about autonomy in just a minute. Now, so we talked a little bit about what we see in adolescence and the changes that we see occurring there. Well, we're also going to see changes in parenting. And so um, parenting changes that contribute to parent adolescent relationships are going to involve things like marital satisfaction. We already talked about that. And, you know, a more satisfied marriage, um, that scenario is going to likely uh, produce a, a better family climate. And we're going to talk about um, how co-parenting comes into this because this is a real, that's a really important factor um, about co-parenting. Um, economic burden, um, you know, is, uh, is the family uh, struggling? It, uh, you know, socioeconomic status is a big play here. Um, do they have access to resources? Are they able to uh, spend time with their, their children? Are they working two and three jobs? Are they working swing shifts because they're trying to put food on the table? Um, are they struggling? These are things that are going to really impact um, the, the relationship and the dynamic. And if there are changes to the financial situation, so let's say when the kids were younger, things looked better and then there was a change, um, maybe a parent lost their job or maybe they, there was a divorce and now they only have one income. These are all things that are going to impact um, the, uh, the, the parenting relationship with the, with the children. Um, also, a lot of times, you know, as a, a parent, 
um, starts to have kids old enough to be in adolescence, there might be some career reevaluation. They may not be happy with the job that they have. Maybe they want to go back to school. Maybe they want to get a, you know, a different degree or a higher degree. These are all things that might occur um, during that uh, period of time where you have adolescent children. Um, time constraints are always a factor, you know, being able to, uh, you know, you, you go to work, you, you, you have limited time with your kids, you, you know, you want to supervise them and monitor them, but that's going to, you know, maybe cut into your second job. You know, all of these things can factor in, um, you know, you might say, well, I don't, you know, I don't have time to do the things that I want to do with my kids because they're, they have sports or they have this, or I have work or whatever. So all of this factors in, um, also health and body concerns. So, you know, parents, they might, you know, have some health concerns that, uh, worry them. And so if they're in a situation where they're dealing with their own, um, uh, health and body concerns, or they're not as active as they could be that, of course, these changes that occur as a person's aging, um, you know, they might be in their forties and fifties, uh, and, you know, their bodies are, are changing as well. Well, um, and their health might be declining, and that's something that that they would have to consider as part of you know these these factors that that are in, uh, involved. And and what we also find too is that marital satisfaction tends to increase as an adolescent um, or emerging adult who leaves home. And so as less of this stress becomes an everyday thing, um, we're seeing that marital satisfaction tends to go up. Um, and they tend to be more uh, happier. They tend to be happier in their relationship um, when the stress reduces. And so one way to reduce the stress is that the child or the adolescent moves out or, or emerging adult moves out <laughs> and uh, maybe goes to college or, you know, goes, goes in the military or gets a job and moves out, whatever it might be. So we do see changes happening there. Does anybody have any questions about the maturation stuff? Are we good with that? So give me a thumbs up if you feel pretty good about that. Great. Um, okay, so let's talk about developmental trajectories, okay? Um, and so <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we have to realize that adults are following one trajectory in their life, right? And children and adolescents are following their own. Okay. So because we have so many different domains here and so many different factors to consider, um, everybody's on their own track and their track is going to be different. And the, the, the adults are following one track. And then, you, you know, if you have multiple adolescents or multiple children, they're each following their own developmental track. Um, but how these, uh, these trajectories intertwine and, and cross over, how they mesh is really important for understanding um, different sort of uh, uh, um, um, family tasks, uh, how, how the family deals with particular uh, challenges. All of this is going to factor in um, how these partic particular trajectories kind of cross over into each other. Um, and so, <clears throat> One thing that's really interesting is that as the decades have kind of shown us over time, um, adults are having children later in life, right? So the, 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 the likelihood of a person having, um, uh, usually uh, we see um, men um, marrying later than women. So men tend to be older. Not, not that much older, but a little bit older than women. And then we see, of course, this also follow the pattern that um, men tend to be slightly older than women um, when having their first child. And we can see that the, the age of first child has shifted substantially. Does anybody want to give a guess as to why we're seeing a, a increased delay in age of first child? We also see this, this delay in marriage, but then we see an additional delay on top of that of first child. So does anybody want to venture a guess as to why we're seeing a, a delay in age in first child? What do you guys think? Like, why are we having kids later on? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, because we're not adults yet. We're not ready. Okay. So do you don't feel like you're ready yet? Like emotionally, you're just like, I, I want to do, I want to work with myself. Everything. Okay. And I All think that's, 
that's a really interesting point because I think that this has become especially big for this, this current, like your generation, like the current generation, and maybe the generation right before you a little bit, but more so for this generation, it's like, I am just trying to be alive and, and I'm just trying to care for myself. Right. And you want to be able to, um, take care of yourself first, because you're like, I can barely adult, let alone take care of another human being. Right. So I feel like that is a big attitude towards parenting right now. So I do think that that's a huge factor. And that is a cultural shift. That's an actual cultural shift in thinking about starting a family. Right. So here's a couple of other ones that people are saying all really great points. So I'm going to go to chat real quick, pursuing education first, wanting to settle down before parents. That's a huge factor. Better medical services for women. Living is more expensive. Birth control, all huge factors. Less financially stable, another huge factor. We see the rates of uh, rent, for example, huge, okay? And childcare, like the price of mortgage, right? Um, somebody said the world is too crazy to bring a kid into. And you know, some again, that's the shift in thinking of like, you know what? I don't want to... I, I'm going to go against the, the cultural standard of, I have to have kids because I'm of the age and I'm going to, I don't, I don't think that the world is stable enough right now to have children. And you're making a choice. You're making a choice because you have better health care, You have access to birth control. You have education and knowledge on safe sex practices, um, on avoiding pregnancies. Um, and this is any gender. I'm not talking about specifically just women or just men. Everybody is much more educated on, on those factors. Um, and all of these play into that. Every single one that you guys have listed and talked about. So the shift, the shift in cultural thinking, this idea that, um, you know, I want to pursue education first. And that is a huge one. That's probably one of the biggest ones, um, factors of why the delay has occurred in the last couple of decades. Um, and we're talking about a pretty big shift from like 18 to like 21. And that's like you getting out of college and saying, okay, well, I think I'm ready to start a family now because I'm going to start my career and I'm going to be able to make enough money to be financially stable. So these are reasons why we see this, this timing of par parenthood shifting right to an older age. Now think about this though. This is um, this, this, this developmental trajectory. So your adult trajectory, the timing of entry into marriage, the timing of, um, entry into, uh, cohabitation. So whether you're living with a romantic partner, it doesn't matter if you're married or not, just the fact that you're cohabitating, that you're living together. Um, the fact that you're, that you're having kids later. Okay. All of these trajectories, right. Are going to affect your parenting style. It's going to affect who you, you know, uh, um, how you decide to manage your family. Um, and so if you think about, you know, your brain at 25 is, is fully mature, you're going to be making different parental decisions when you have an adolescent later on than a person who maybe had their first kid at 17, 18 years old. There's a different trajectory, right? For every person. Doesn't mean that just because you're more mature uh, that you're going to make better decisions, right? Um, we, we, we all know cases of people who are older and they have kids and they're not the best parents. So it doesn't always mean that you're going to be a better parent. There's some people you probably know that had a kid at 17 and they're way better parents than some people who had kids later. So it, it's not a great predictor in that case for, for everybody. But, but we do find that the more mature you are, um, and, uh, the more financially stable, the more educated you are, the more likely you're going to make better decisions, but that's not always the case. Um, um, another thing that, uh, the child development trajectories are going to include are things like timing of childcare, uh, entry into middle school. Um, what, when were they born? Were they held back? Uh, how old are they as they enter high school or they enter junior high? All of these things are going to influence, um, their, uh, um, their development and their education and their response to education. All of these things are going to impact um, that, that adolescent. Um, and so uh, we also find too, and, and this is something that I didn't mention before, but I think that's pretty intuitive, is that the marital relationship does vary with the timing of parental onset. You know, it depends on uh, how long that person, those, those, that couple was together. It depends on what their relationship looked like prior to parenthood. Um, all of these things are going to 
factor in to their parenting style and their family management style. So, which brings us very nicely to parents as managers, right? And so <clears throat> we can think of parents as being managers, right? And so in order for an adolescent to reach their full potential, we can assume um, that parents really need to be an effective manager who um, finds information, makes contacts, they help that adolescent structure choices, uh, structure choices for that adolescent so that they're making good choices and give them chances to, in some cases, safely fail, right? And also provide guidance. So um, we can see parents as sort of serving as a regulator of opportunities. And so what that means is that they are managing that adolescent social contact with their peers, um, you know, so the people that are in that same age group, their friends and other adults and making sure that the relationships with adults, for example, that they're safe. Um, we want to make sure that um, family management practices, right, are going to be safe and uh, they're going to be sort of tailored to that adolescent because we know that when you have good family management practices, that is positively related to getting better grades, having the adolescent have more self-responsibility and make better choices. So when the family management practices are good practices, then we know that that is a, a positive reflection into uh, the future of that adolescent. And part of that is maintaining structure, right? Um, maintaining an organized family environment. There are no big surprises. It's not like you know you're stressing that 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 kid out, that adolescent out, because they don't know what to expect, right? So if they don't know if they're going to eat dinner when they get home, they don't know if they're going to have food, they don't know if they're going to have a parent pick them up after school, or they don't know if somebody's going to be home. And if there's a disorganized unpredictable life, then that is going to um, uh, have a, a worse impact on that adolescent than if they had some structure to their life, right? Um, if they knew, okay, uh, you know, most days I come home, I do my homework, Mom, mom's going to be home or dad's going to be home. Um, I know to take the bus and I know when I get there, somebody's going to be home. I know that, you know, um, we typically do these, this thing on Saturday. We typically, you know, have a schedule. These things are going to much more positively affect that adolescent. And, and it's good to have some structure and some organization. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you have to have your whole life planned out, right? Every single day planned out. It just means that there is some expectation for what that adolescent's life is going to look like and that that is a consistent expectation, right? Um, just like you feel scattered when your everyday changes and you don't know what you're doing from time to time, that can be very stressful, right? So um, another thing is that uh, parents need to uh, effectively monitor their adolescent, right? And so this is especially important in that prepubescent period where, you know, you, you kind of transitioning into adulthood, I mean, excuse me, into adolescence, and you want to make sure that the parents are managing, like, who are you talking to? What are you, what, what is the nature of those conversations? Like what's going on? Um, and when an adolescent is more open to disclosing to parents about their whereabouts and activities and their friends and what they're doing with their friends, that's much more positively related and linked to really good adolescent adjustment. And so um, that relationship begins earlier than when you, when you start, when you're in adolescence, right? So having that, you know, open disclosure and having that information uh, that you're sort of fine with providing your parents, that is going to be established earlier on. So pre-adolescent, you know, pre-puberty, if, if the parent can really establish a good relationship with their child, understanding who their friends are, and then, you know, talking to their kids and saying, you know, oh, who did you talk to today and what happened? That relationship is established earlier on and that moves you through adolescence. So this is not something that as soon as they hit puberty, you start. This is a process that needs to be started earlier. So the next thing that I want to talk about is uh, going back to parenting styles. And what I'm going to do is since we're right at time, I'm going to go ahead and cover um, these on the video. And then I'm going to go into uh, the rest of this, this material on a video. Um, and so that way you guys have that and can use that um, in place of class on Friday. Um, and so when, as soon as I have the video up, I encourage you to go ahead and take a look at it. So what I'm going to do is open up for questions. I'm going to um, hit and record and I'm going to use the last few 
you know, minute of the class to, to open up for questions. 